Uh, well, thank you for the invitation to uh, come and speak to you all today. And uh, it's my first trip to Ireland. Uh, sadly, I'll be here for less than 24 hours, but never mind. Uh, and as your chairman just said, it was touch and go whether we'd make it today because Manchester Airport was closed for three hours today because there was a dusting of snow on the runway. So um, anyway, we Aer Lingus got us through, so no problem at all. Um, tonight's talk then, the call what he made. Um, I'll, I will explain the connection, but for a lot of you in the room, uh, Morecambe and Wise, the two gentlemen here, I believe are familiar faces, as familiar as people uh, born and brought up in England. Uh, there is an important connection to those, well, one of them anyway, and tonight's talk. What I'm actually talking about is the mobile phone. And we're looking at the developments of the mobile phone from the days when Dr. Martin Cooper of Motorola actually built in his hand there the first truly recognisable mobile phone. This was built and tested on the 3rd of April 1973. Uh, the photograph I have to stress was not taken in 1973. Uh, Martin Cooper was a lot younger then. This was taken in 2013 celebrating the 40th anniversary of his achievement. So we're actually going to look at that thing he's holding and bring it forward through to today to see how uh, the world has changed. Um, but actually the roots of cellular don't start in 1973, they actually start um, way back in 1947 with this uh, technical memorandum entitled Mobile Telephony Wide Area Coverage written by the Bell Telephone Laboratories um, Authored, and what a, what a name to be writing a paper about telephones, Douglas Ring. He had to work on telephones at the time, um, and William Rob Young. So this team at BTO Bell Labs in America actually in 1947 came up with the concepts of cellular. The problem being the technology of the day was not capable of building what they envisaged. So there was a huge delay before Motorola and Martin Cooper built one. And the really rubbing the salt in the wound aspect of Martin Cooper's story is when he got the phone working, he phoned the head of Bell Labs to tell them <laughs> he got their idea working. So that really was rubbing the salt in the wound. There was a gap between the mobile telephone as envisaged by the cellular concept and making it a reality. And what I want to do is just show you a video because this is the interim technology that we had um, prior to going truly cellular. And this is um, a Pathé news clip, it's freely available on YouTube for anyone to watch. And it's the South Lancashire Radio Telephone Service, which was the first introduced in the UK.
So that, that was the, <clears throat> the mobile technology we had first, uh, before we went to what we regard as mobile now. And of course, whenever you see films of that era, they're always like the one you've just seen. They always show you with the handset in the car and a small unit on the dashboard. What they very rarely show you is the box of electronics that was actually stored in the boot of the car uh, to actually make it all work. It was certainly not a technology that you were going to carry around with you on your person. And you've got to realise there's some limitations to this system which are important to appreciate why cellular is so much better. The person in the car is communicating with a radio base station. Now the South Lancashire Radio Telephone Service had two uh, transmitters covering the northwest of England. That then was connected by landline into the telephone exchange, which you saw on the film, the lady was using plug board, and that of course connected to the conventional telephone system. That then provided the connection, and of course the telephonist had to ask the car operator to switch to a free radio channel. She said, please switch to channel two, please. So there was a general channel used for call setup, and then a particular channel used for each individual call. And this meant you actually needed a different radio channel for each separate telephone call. And that was a huge limitation. So typical installation of equipment in the car. On the left there is an advert of a Pi radio telephone service, and it says it's a seven channel system. So you can handle seven simultaneous telephone calls. The point about this is that you actually, because the radio transmitters are so far away, you needed a high power transmitter at the user's end. Hence you needed a car with enough battery power to power a big box of electronics to do that. The other problem was we had a limited number of frequencies which limited how many phone calls we could make. So those were the two primary limitations of the radio telephone service, both of which were addressed by the 1947 paper, and they came up with the cellular system, and I'm sure most of you are aware of this. What we do is we break the country up into much smaller zones called cells. Each has its own transmitter, and wherever your phone is, you are going to be quite close to one of them. And of course, if you're close, you don't need such a strong signal, you don't need so much power, you're starting to think about a technology which can have smaller batteries. Also, if the signal is relatively low power, it means here, where the phone is shown in a cell using frequency set A, the chances of one of the other radio masts picking up that same frequency is pretty remote. So long as the adjacent cells do not use the same frequency, we can reuse frequency A or B or C or D over and over again on the cellular system. And frequency reuse is a critical part of why the mobile phone works. So as we roam, we will eventually reach a cell boundary, at which point the phone has to switch to the frequency set of the next cell, which it stays in until the next boundary, and then it switches again. So here, we're back on frequency A because the chances of the radio signal from that cell reaching the one we started at is so low, there'll be no interference. So that frequency reuse is such a critical part of cellular systems. In America, following um, the uh, Martin Cooper's demonstration, the first operational cellular system started in uh, Illinois Bell, and the first one in Europe actually came from the Scandinavian countries uh, the Nordic Mobile Telephone System, NMT, and that launched in 1981. The UK government actually decided to go cellular and announced there would be two licences for this. The first automatically went to BT, and BT created uh, the company Cellnet, and the other was open to competition and was won by a newly formed company, part of Raycal Group, and it was called Vodafone. Now, <clears throat> Vodafone as a name, at this point in time, I think is really quite innovative because it's voice data on a telephone. Well, to talk about data in 1982, really, that's quite something. Uh, you know, we're in the web, World Wide Web, 
was still seven years in the future as far as Tim Berners-Lee was concerned. So talking about data at that point was really quite something. The system used was analog, uh, based on the American system called Total Access Communication System. Two frequency bands are selected around the 900 megahertz uh, range, and that gave us 625 kilohertz analog channels for the voice. So it's analog transmission, traditional radio technology um, in terms of the voice coding and so on. And on the 1st of January, 1985, the first of those companies actually made a phone call when this chap, Michael Harrison, left the New Year's Day family party just before the strike of midnight, was driven into Parliament Square of London, where he then made a phone call to his dad, Sir Ernest Harrison, chief exec of Raquel Vodafone, using their mobile network and a Panasonic VM1. And that was officially the first phone call made on the Vodafone network in the UK because their license to offer commercial services started on the 1st of January. So all the calls they made up to that point were test transmissions and test calls, and there had been them, and there'd been those on CellNet as well. But here we had the first true one on the commercial service. But later that day, because this of course has only just come to light, this was an unknown fact uh, until just this last year. Because later that same day, Ernie Wise was taken by Royal Mail stagecoach to St Catherine's Dock in London, where he made a telephone call using a Panasonic VM1 to Vodafone headquarters in Newbury, and he publicly inaugurated the UK mobile phone system. Um, and that is the call what he made um, as, um, you're probably familiar with Morgan Wise, the plays what he wrote, well this is the call what he made. So Early Wise publicly inaugurated the UK's first mobile phone network to go live on the 1st of January 1985, the Vodafone network, and um, I was very privileged to be invited by Vodafone to help in their 30th celebrations, just, just done it this last Christmas, and so those of you on Twitter, if you want to participate, uh, there's quite a hashtag there, my first mobile, something we all have a relationship with, I think the first one we ever had, um, 30 years Vodafone. So the UK is celebrating 30 years of having the mobile phone in the country. Um, and it was headline news, as you'd expect, something so revolutionary. The Times carried it on page two. Such was the importance of this. And that's how much coverage was given to this momentous event uh, of 1985. Uh, the Guardian didn't cover it in the main paper, it covered it in the Financial Guardian two days later on page 15. So it wasn't quite the runaway storming success that perhaps, you know, wasn't the media event of the day. Now, when Apple launches the iPhone, it's a global media event. This was the first phone call anywhere officially in the country, and it was on page two of the Times and page six, uh, 15 of the Guardian. So not quite hitting the headlines. But it's quite interesting um, looking at the old adverts of the day. Um, so here's a typical uh, Vodafone um, advert from this period, a dial-in handset, a liquid crystal display, speed dialing, electronic lock, last number redial, quick fit rechargeable batteries, low battery warning, and a mobile adapter. Again, you know, all of these handsets, um, hands-free operation, that was a classic, um, rechargeable battery. And you're talking two, three thousand pounds per handset to purchase. And so you wonder, why did people buy a mobile phone at that time? And I was fortunate when we were doing the celebrations to meet this happy chappy on the left, uh, Roger Southam. Roger runs a property business, and he was one of the very first customers of Vodafone in the UK. And I, you can see I managed to get a, a bit of a chat with him. And I said to him, why did you buy a mobile phone? Hugely expensive, the networks weren't brilliant, why did you bother? 
And he said, simple, I was a property business, I was on the road four days of every week. The fifth day, I had to be in my office making all the phone calls for that week. Buying a mobile phone meant I could be on the road five days a week, not four. And that was all he needed to justify that big investment in that technology. So, obviously, not a cheap option, but a real business benefit, um, even in those days. These photographs were taken, and I'm, I'm able to reproduce them thanks to Vodafone. As I say, we were brought, taken down to their Oxford Street store in London just before Christmas to have a, a celebration of, of 30 years of, of mobile phones. So these photographs were taken at that event. Um, and, of course, Cellnet, BT Cellnet, started uh, seven days later. So within a week, we had the two networks up and running. And phones started to look like this iconic brick phone, the Motorola 8500. Um, iconic in terms of Wall Street movie with Michael Douglas. Um, on the comedy side, um, Del Boy in Only Fools and Horses. And, you know, this was the one that people will think of as the iconic 1980s mobile phone. But Nokia and Motorola were the two dominant and innovative handset manufacturers. So Nokia's 1320 City Man was an equivalent to the Motorola, and then the Motorola MicroTAC were the world's first flip phone, that is with a, um, a plate which covered the keyboard and then moved to reveal the keyboard, and again, miniaturization of its day. This is still an analog phone, but Motorola was an important innovator. Nokia have always preferred what we call the candy bar design, like the 101 on the left. No moving parts as such, whereas Motorola have always been for flips and things like this. And they created, on the right, the famous StarTac, the world's first clamshell phone that folds completely in half uh, when not in use. That phone, when it um, came on the market in 1996, was the world's smallest and lightest mobile phone ever. The only problem was, ounce for ounce, it cost more than the equivalent weight in gold. So these were not cheap items. Now, obviously, I'm in Ireland, so we better just put in some slides about what happened here. Um, the first launch of mobile phones in Ireland uh, was um, Air and Telecom with Aircell, first analogue network, uh, 1984, the licence was awarded, 1986 launch. It used the same system as in Britain, the tax system at 900 megahertz. Anybody seen any photographs of that iconic first phone call? Did they do anything? I've no idea, I'm just asking. I, I did try and Google it and couldn't find anything. My biggest bugbear about the mobile phone industry is they're so obsessed about tomorrow They've done nothing to record what happened yesterday. And when we were getting ready for that Vodafone event, they were asking me about their history, because they had nothing. And I said to them, that Malcolm and Wise, Ernie Wise launch, there were two photographs that I've only ever seen. Do you have the originals? And they said, we thought there was only one. You know, the, the story, the record of mobile phone heritage is rubbish and they had to re-engineer their own corporate history to put on some of the exhibitions that they've done. Which is great sadness, really. And, you know, the, this must have had a first inaugural phone call of Ireland. Did anybody bother to record it? Quite an iconic event, how sad. If anybody does find it, I would be very interested uh, to know more. Ten years on from that iconic launch of the mobile phone, in Britain, if you wanted to make a phone call whilst outside, you could do it very readily. And it was very obvious where and how, because it was conveniently identified by a nice red box. That, for most people, was how you made a phone call when you were outside of the house. The K6 red telephone box. Because, ten years on, only 7% of the UK population had a mobile phone. So the analog era 
really, we only got 7% penetration 10 years after that first launch. The other thing is, most of those phones stopped working at the English Channel. Because although France, Holland, Belgium, Germany also had mobile phone systems, they weren't compatible. So the phone that you had in Britain didn't work in Germany, etc., etc. So for a mobile phone manufacturer, there's no economy of scale. You actually have to produce different products for different European countries. So a big hindrance to actually making this technology widespread. And that was recognised. And on the 7th of September 1987, Chris Gent, chief exec of Vodafone, said this document on the left was the most important document written in the history of the mobile phone. This document, the Memorandum of Understanding for the Implementation of a Pan-European 900 megahertz Digital Cellular Mobile Phone Service by 1991. Say what you like about the European Union, this is a tremendous success story of European cooperation and collaboration across its member countries. This was the decision to create a pan-European single standard mobile phone service which became known as GSM. And that's become a world beater technology. And it was the one to unify the mobile phone service of the Europe that drove that. They did not set out to create a digital system the goal was to create a unified system. They made the decision to go digital, but that was because that was deemed to be the best technological way of achieving the goal. And so 2G, as we call it, actually becomes digital from the analogue service. Um, it's actually frequency division, so the spectrum is divided up into 200 kilohertz channels. Within that 200 kilohertz channel, we then time slice the data so that we have uh, a multi-frame, which itself contains 26 frames. Um, within that, each frame contains eight time slots. Those time slots can contain 140 bits of digital data with a voice codec giving us a 30 kilobit per second voice coding uh, on GSM. So we've got a digital voice transmission system. Um, the frequencies actually in the UK were the same as the analogue frequency. In fact, they never released the full spectrum of analogue frequencies and the upper end was reserved for GSM. Uh, and then later, the UK government decided in order to make the mobile phone more universal, we needed more operators. And so they released new frequencies around 1800 megahertz for new entrants to join the mobile phone market. The first GSM network operator was over in Finland and it did start in 1991 as the request was made um, for um, uh, that document memorandum of understanding. In the UK, um, Vodafone opened their first GSM network on 900 megahertz in 1992. We then had the first of the new entrant companies Mercury 1 to 1 joined 1993 on 1800 megahertz. That was the world's first 1800 megahertz <laughs> mobile phone service. BT Cellnet went digital on 900 megs in December 93. And the second of the new entrants, Orange, um, Hutchison Telecom, um, based in Hong Kong. Um, they crop up quite a few times in this story, as you'll see, um, was the second 1800 megahertz network in 1994. Once you've got a European standard, then you've actually got the potential to mass produce product that works in multiple countries. But strangely, the first GSM phones were almost a step back to the analog days because that, the Motorola 3200, is Motorola's first GSM phone. It's slightly smaller than their brick analog phone. The Nokia was a little bit better, but the 1011, their first GSM phone, was a chunky beast of a phone. So the best analogue phones of the day were smaller than the latest digital handsets to come out of uh, Motorola and Nokia. And of all the Nokia numbers, you often think, well, how do they work out these numbers for their products? 
The 1011 is the only one that I've ever seen any sense to because that phone was launched on the 10th of November. 1011. That's honestly where it came from. So we've got handsets now, digital, um, but once you've got this mass market, what you see, not only do you start to see the technology reduced, so the Siemens M200 is important, that was a launch device on the Mercury network, that's one of the very first 1800 megahertz phones. Then you've got real products that were mass market, Nokia's 3210, uh, did anybody here have a 3210? Yeah. There we go, you still got it, you said? It's a classic phone. Um, it was a mass market phone. But then you see Samsung, Ericsson, Bosch, Alcatel. The, the range of manufacturers is broadened out. And what you also find is that manufacturing of these handsets is very European focused. So Europe actually becomes a major manufacturing centre for mobile phones with GSM. It's kind of where it's happening is in Europe at this point in time. In Ireland, um, my understanding is that Aircell actually launched their first GSM network in 1993 as part of the 900 megahertz. That then went into a deal with Vodafone, so it was jointly branded in 2000, and now of course is Vodafone Ireland. So that network, which started in its analog days, went digital in 93, and is actually the base, the bedrock of what you've now got as Vodafone. The second licence was offered to ESAT Digifone, which was a combination of uh, the Irish company ESAT and the, um, was it Swedish or Norwegian? Norwegian. Norwegian, Norwegian uh, Telema Group. <coughs> now, my understanding is there was not a happy relationship between those two. Uh, BT actually then made a bid to take over ESAT and eventually ESAT Digifone was absorbed into BT Wireless. Now, BT Wireless in the UK was Cellnet, the BT network, which of course was then carved off as a private company, NMO2, which then became O2, and in 2002 was taken over by the Spanish Telefonica. So, of course, your second license here um, was morphed into O2. And the third license was awarded to Meteor in 1998, but there were some shenanigans there, because Orange were not happy about the award of that license. So it was two years later before Meteor launched. Uh, by this time, Air and Telecom had privatised to become Aircom, and they now brand themselves as Meteor. So your three 2G licences now manifest themselves as Vodafone, O2 and, and Meteor. And of course, it's a dynamic market. We'll come on to the subsequent changes, both here and in the UK, uh, shortly. So that's my understanding of the evolution over here um, compared to what happened in uh, the UK. Once we went digital, and we've got here 1995, so 10 years on from that first analog system, we've got about 7% of the UK population with a mobile phone. Once the digital networks and GSM really takes hold, the UK goes mobile crazy. And the tipping point was 1999, when you can see, look at the, the gradient, the sharpness of that curve. It's almost vertical at that point. They were selling one new mobile phone every four seconds. That is when the UK really went mobile crazy, and we shot through the 46% onwards to over 50% and beyond ownership. And statistics is a wonderful thing, because in 2004, we reached the crazy notion of 100% ownership. And we've exceeded that since then. So the official figures now for the UK are something of the order of 130% ownership. But there are people who don't have a mobile phone. And of course, what's happening here, they're dividing the number of mobile subscriptions by the population to get that percentage. And several people have two or three active phones, where that skews the whole statistic. But it is a fact which I use regularly
to say there are more mobile phones in the UK than there are living people. And that is certainly statistically true, at least. A massive growth takes off with digital uh, mobile phones. It was the price because once you've got a unified European system, you as a manufacturer can now mass produce the product. That drives your prices down. You've also got more manufacturers coming in, competition drives them down. The handset is actually now usable, you can hold the thing. And as you'll see in a moment, there's other aspects to how that phone is marketed and designed, which starts appealing to a different consumer. What's happened is the mobile phone of the analog days was sold to the business user. Now what you see is the mobile phone companies targeting the general public. The cellular network for digital actually still has those cells that we saw earlier. Each of those cell masts are controlled by base station controller and the link obviously from the mast back to the base station controller is either cable or direct um, microwave off the <coughs> The only bit that's truly wireless on a mobile network is the bit from your handset to that first tower of course. Um, that's all then linked through what we call a mobile switching centre off into the telephone network. But it's built as a circuit switch network, telephony network. Um, and of course what we also got with 2G is the subscriber um, identity module, the SIM card. There were no SIM cards in the analogue phones. And does anybody know who this chap is? And guess what he might have done? He did something rather important. Text message. Text message. He was. Um, that's Neil Papworth. Um, and Richard Jarvis and Neil Papworth exchanged the first text message. Um, now it had to be sent from a computer because mobile phones at this point could not transmit text. They could only receive text. And the Orbital 901 which I'm very pleased to have now acquired, a copy of one of those, was the first GSM licensed phone in the UK, and that was the one on which the first text message was received. 3rd of December 1992, Merry Christmas. That was the world's first text message uh, sent. And that's what digital networks gave us as well. The ability to transmit something other than traditional voice. And the text message, of course, as we all know the story, I suspect, was created as a means of the network informing the user about important events. It was seen as a, a transmission system to inform the users about events on the network. It was never envisaged as being a user-to-user -user communication system. But again, I think a prime driver of this was the cheapness of text messaging. And people, you know, if you were going to build a machine to transmit a text message, would you have stuck to a numeric keypad? It's not instinctively built for sending text. Despite that, people were prepared to overcome the limitations of the interface to really embrace text messaging. And these are UK figures from Ofcom showing the growth of the text message from 2000 through to 2013. And something quite interesting has happened. It started to decline for the first time. Um, typically, the average UK user, according to Ofcom, sends 50 messages a week. When I go around schools and say that, they laugh me out of the classroom, because most kids do that in an hour, let alone a week. Um, and we had, in 2013, a dramatic 4.6% drop uh, in the use of text messaging, taking us down to a pathetically small 145 billion messages a year. Still huge, but what's happening is we're starting to see a slight move away from SMS text messaging for instant messaging and other applications. In order to facilitate text messaging, the mobile phone companies had to invent ways of allowing us to type on a keypad. Now, all they had to do was look at the telephone industry um, and look at the old rotary dial phones, which all had letters associated with the numbers, and reinvented it on the left, the traditional T9, text on nine keys. 
a text entry system. So multiple presses of each key go through the different letters of the alphabet. Blackberry always did something interesting. Um, if you look at this one, this has got A, B, C on number two, D, E, F on number three. You go down the alphabet A to Z. With Blackberry on their sure type system, it's QWERTY along here. What they've actually done is they've put letters on the keypad, but they've used the QWERTY keypad arrangement um, to do quite a different approach. And Motorola followed the Nokia plan, the traditional telephone system, and their system is called ITAM. All systems designed to try and make it easy to use the numeric keypads for texting. Because the other thing, um, Nokia realised, how do you get people to buy the second mobile phone? If everybody has one, and you're a mobile phone manufacturer, you're out of business. So how do you persuade people to buy another handset? And they captured the idea of personalisation. And the idea, you could change the cover on the mobile phone, was enough to say, well, actually, if my phone doesn't change the cover, I'd better buy one that does. And a whole new industry is created selling and manufacturing covers for your mobile phone, including, appropriate choice, I thought, for this island, uh, Guinness Special Edition and so on. You've got a whole industry now making plastic covers for mobile phones. The phone is still a GSM text and voice phone. Technologically, no improvement, but personalization. Ringtones, another huge business. If you hear that, you hear Nokia. That becomes the iconic tune. But the problem with ringtones is you want them to be more melodious. So what you really want is phones like the 3510, which is a MIDI system that can play more than one note at the same time. So all of a sudden, you upgrade your phone because you haven't got a MIDI capability on your ringtone playback. So you upgrade the phone because it has a more melodious <coughs> ringtone. And a whole new industry is created selling ringtones. And you don't need to charge much for a ringtone if there are millions of users. And the most successful ringtone in the history of ringtones uh, is actually this one. There are some very knowing looks in the audience, they all know she probably had it. Um, that sold £10 million pounds of revenue for its owner, for its authors, in its first year of release. It's Crazy Frog. The first, that is the one that is, again, the most successful ringtone. It's got nothing to do with the phone, in terms of a telephony system. All of a sudden, these phones are more than phones. And I thought this was a lovely story from the BBC. Um, the, a bride turns up for a wedding day to be told that the church organist is not available. And she'll have to parade up the aisle to silence. And fortunately, in the, order, in the congregation was a person who had a mobile phone who actually had the wedding march as a ringtone. And on this occasion, they played the ringtone through the PA system in the church, and the bride marched up the aisle as intended, but it was thanks to a mobile phone that saved the day. So a ringtone saves the bride, the, the bride's big day. Just goes to show, you never know when that ringtone you have comes into being. We must never lose sight of the timeline. The internet began life in 1969. The first mobile phone is 1973. We launched in the UK in 85. The World Wide Web, Tim Berners-Lee's paper, Information Management and Proposal, The Blueprint of the Web, March 1989. 2G, digital phones, 92. The first ISP in the UK for the general public, <coughs> Demon Internet, 1992. Internet Explorer, in the Microsoft system, 1995. And in 1996, Nokia launched this, their communicator, which combines the computer and the mobile phone in one easy to use package. And the obvious question was, 
Why don't we connect these two things together? And that's what the Nokia 7110 did, because this is the world's first web browser on a phone using the wireless application protocol, or WAP. And this is the integration of the mobile phone with the web. Now, anyone who remembers this time knows it was an absolute disaster because they tried to market this as the internet on your hand. Well, let's face it, look at the size of the screen. WAP was not a replacement for the web experience. Massively oversold, but technologically an important step. Integration of computers and phones continued. IBM claimed fame to their first smartphone. Orange produced this rather interesting video phone in 1999. But Ericsson, with the R380, was the first company to promote the product, see on the box, as a smartphone. They were the first ones to promote that phraseology. Um, and of course, people like Blackberry went on to start setting this tone and the style of what we might call a smartphone. But if you're going to connect the internet to your mobile phone, you need more bandwidth. And at the moment, if you want to connect that phone on a 2G network to the telephone network, that's what it's built for, circuit switch telephony. If you want to put data on that, you've actually got to use the same connection. That is equivalent to those of you that remember dial-up internet, using a dial-up modem to connect to the internet. So, the best you could get on circuit switch data was about 9.6 kilobit per second. But, if you create, in your mobile network, a separate digital network for internet connectivity, shown here by the blue line, what you now do at the base station controller is switch the telephony, as before, but you switch the data over a new high-speed core digital network onto the internet. And that is GPRS, or 2.5G. So it's got circuit switch voice, but what we're now doing is switching out data onto the GPS network, GPRS, sorry, network. And that means we could get more bandwidth to the phone, because now the phone is being used to connect us to the internet. That's the equivalent, really, of going from a dial-up modem to those of you who remember the V90 modem. Uh, the 56K modem. Uh, it was that sort of step change on, on there. So 2.5G, and uh, again, Cellnet was the first to launch uh, GPRS in the UK, followed by Vodafone, Orange, and T-Mobile. And T-Mobile, by the way, had bought Mercury one-to-one. -one. So you'll see logo changes uh, as it happens uh, through takeovers. Handsets have now got more GPRS uh, connectivity and you're starting to see things like the Nokia 7650. The screens are getting a bit bigger because we're actually starting to have data displayed on the phone. And we're also at this point getting the camera on the phone. It's the launch of GPRS that then gives us the desire to put a digital camera in the phone for uploading and sending photographs uh, between uh, users. Uh, the GX30 from Sharp on the right is the first megapixel uh, camera phone uh, that I'm aware of. But of course we keep saying well, we want more data. There's a shift that says we want more and more of this data stuff and less of the voice and less of the texting. And actually by changing the digital coding, uh, the way the data was encoded on the network, we created Edge, which is a software change in effect, uh, and often that's called 2.75G, and the first in the UK to launch was the Orange Network with the BlackBerry 8700 um, uh, GPRS phone. Um, sorry, Edge, Edge phone. But there's only so far you can go with 2G technology, and we needed to move on to another sort of technology. So. <coughs> by changing the radio interface quite dramatically and upgrading that digital core network we create the concept of 3G um, and a universal mobile telephone system uh, UMTS it's still circuit switch voice but we've changed the radio interface that's new frequencies 
and that means new licenses, and we've upgraded the core network to take more digital bandwidth. So you've got a fatter pipe to the internet, if you wish to have a simple analogy. Data rates now start going up from 384 kilobits, and we have an auction in the UK for licenses to operate these new frequencies. This is a piece of paper they're bidding for, and what you will see is Vodafone, Cellnet, T-Mobile, Orange, and new entrant company three collectively paid just short of £22.5 billion pounds for a piece of paper. The consequence is, and that was in April 2000, we then had to wait for three to five years before any of those companies had enough spare capital to build the networks for which they got the license. And subsequent, I've seen some economic analysis done for the UK that actually said it might have brought in a windfall to the government in 2000, but the UK lost traction on 3G. Um, and if you then look at the loss of opportunity costs, that probably means that the UK benefited by four or five billion pounds because we lost market share, we lost our position on 3G. Just to um, cover the story behind the logos, Orange, which was launched by Hutchison Telecom, at this point has now been taken over by the French and is France Telecom, and Hutchison Telecom have launched three. So the same company that started Orange has now started three. Hutchison One Power from Hong Kong. Handsets got bigger again. The early uh, Motorola A835, the Nokia 7600, the E880, uh, bigger handsets again when we go to 3G, um, particularly on the NEC one, they're really quite a big screen, and a forward-facing camera as well as a, a, a away-facing camera. And at, at the end of that 2006, if you wanted a smartphone, you couldn't really do better than the Nokia N95. That was where we were. And you can see there are variations on that, but they all look a similar sort of thing. But of course, what we didn't realise at that time was the world was about to change, and change quite dramatically. Because upstart Apple, who always concentrated on computers, decided to build a phone. And the Apple iPhone, and I know that Apple has its supporters and its uh, antagonists, you look at mobile phone handsets up to 2006, and they all look like they did on that last slide. No matter who made it, you look at mobile phone handsets post-2007, they look like the iPhone. The iPhone rewrote the book in terms of what a smartphone should look like. So the iPhone rewrote the design. And what happened, I think, was a computer company saw that as a computer first and a telephone second. Up to that point, it was the tele telephone companies that had emerged through all that long history that saw this as a phone that had a connection with a computer and the internet. This was the other looking point of view, and it rewrote the design. It also meant, again, if you look at manufacturing, I said in 2G it was very European centered. Sadly, post the iPhone, it's left Europe and it's now Far East manufactured centers. Um, most used apps are Google Maps, and why is that? Well, phones like the Walkman 760i was one of the first to integrate GPS into a mobile phone. And then, of course, we've predominantly got social media apps at the top of the table. <coughs> Facebook, YouTube, etc. The latest news is that apps are now generating so much more money for their authors. It's a bit like the story of the ringtone and those um, uh, covers and things. An industry has been created writing and selling apps for smartphones. And the latest news here is that the market in 2014 brought in $10, million, $10 billion to the authors of apps for smartphones. Uh, Twitter is particularly interesting uh, because it's very much an evolution of the text message 
and Twitter as a social media system, they're now generating something like 50,000, they're 5,000 tweets a second on Twitter. Do we have any Twitter users here? Yeah, one or two, okay. 60% um, of Twitter comes from mobile phones. And when Twitter started, they wondered how long it would take from the launch day before they had a one billion tweets. And they started a clock, and it started counting. And three years, two months, and one day later, they'd gone from zero to one billion tweets. They're doing that now every 48 hours. And those of you on Twitter, if you want to follow me, um, <laughs> Nigel Lynch is me. Um, so um, I've embraced, I've embraced, I don't do Facebook, but I do do Twitter. I can cope with Twitter, sort of. Uh, <laughs> so it'd be nice to see you on Twitter, um, uh, if, if you want to take the time. We still want more and more bandwidth, because increasingly now the phone is being used for its data, not its telephony. And 4G, every 10 years, mobile phones change generation. So we went from analog, just over 10 years later, digital, 2G, just over 10 years after that, 3G, and just over 10 years after that, this system, 4G. But 4G is so important, it's so radically different. 1G, 2G, and 3G were circuit switched voice networks with added data. There is no circuit switch voice in 4G. 4G is 100% total digital switch network. There is, this is digital switching, no voice, no circuit switch at all. The only way they're going to provide voice on a 4G network is using <coughs> quality of service controls to put voice over IP essentially technology. Now at the moment, as far as I'm aware, all 4G operators actually default back onto the 2 and 3G network for telephony. But what's going to happen when their integrated multimedia system, their IMS systems are commissioned, that will switch all onto 4G and voice will be carried as a data service, not as a circuit switch voice service. Three in Ireland is our data. There's no circuit switch. Pardon? Three in Ireland. Three yeah. has yeah. done that already. No I don't think anyone's done it in the UK yet, so that's good to hear. Essentially, if you're going to do telephony, it's going to be analog to digital, digital to analog, and data will go through the network. Um, again, there was a new license auction in the UK, and this time, a far more sensible <coughs> approach in the UK. Um, about £2.36 billion pounds were spent. And look at the launch date of the auction and the networks. Uh, interestingly, EE, um, because they, EE was now the merger of T-Mobile and Orange, and they had sufficient spare spectrum in that merger to ask to launch 4G services on existing 3G frequencies. And they, that's why they launched, potentially, the year prior to the official auction. So, the launch dates now are within a year of the auction, unlike 3G, where we lost all that lead. BT, of course, who owned Cellnet and sold it on to the Spanish, bought a 4G license. And so far, haven't used it, but more about that in a moment. Phones, again, typical 4G phone, Samsung Galaxy S S4, or better. Um, you know, it looks like a standard iPhone type uh, plan. Now, what I was going to do is uh, just show you so this is going to be a simple speed test between 3G and 4G. This was done um, there go. on the left, an Apple iPhone 3G, S on the right, Samsung Galaxy S4. Uh, so it's on 3G on the left, it's on 4G on the right, uh, and a direct comparison of relative speeds. Using the same app, which is the speed test app, and what you're measuring there is megabits per second download, and then it will measure megabits per second upload. So the iPhone on the left on 3G has achieved 0.97 megabit per second download at this point in time, and the 4G phone 26 megabits per second download 
and the upload is 0.05 versus 14.88 megabits. But there's something else important, the latency. Because actually the latency is also a lot less. So this was a separate speed test, the numbers are different. We had 60 milliseconds here, 101 there. There's less latency in 4G as well as more bandwidth. As soon as you're putting tens of megabits per second of bandwidth into people's hands, 4G is a game changer uh, in the mobile phone world. And it's perhaps not surprising that the mobile phone industry has seen a massive upsurge. What's the killer app for 4G? Video. Consumption of video on a mobile. What happened over here? Well, your 3G auction brought in three licenses to Vodafone 3 and O2. Uh, it, they didn't go crazy like they did over in the UK. The fourth license seemingly was originally offered to Smart Telecom, which never took it up, and then Meteor, but I don't know how much they paid. I can't find any evidence of how much it cost them to get that fourth license. Uh, your 4G launch um, licensing, again, uh, brought these four <coughs> operators into the 4G uh, marketplace. So, Ireland didn't go quite financial crazy like the UK did on 3G. Currently, uh, statistics from uh, Commission for Communications Regulation here in Ireland shows Vodafone on mobile subscriptions, you have to be careful of how these data is calculated, has got 38% share, three, Hutchison uh, Telecom, has 36.3%, but two of your most popular mobile virtual network operators, MVNOs, Tesco and Leica Mobile are actually sitting on three network and they've got this market share between them and Meteor uh, at 18.5%. And if you have a look at the trends, the trends in Ireland are just the same as elsewhere. Um, this is mobile phone minutes, the dark blue, which there's been a slight increase, not much. You could almost say it's flatlining. SMS, SMS text is the green declining. And I showed you a chart earlier that the same is happening in the UK. Machine to machine, this is products using 4G, uh, uh, 2G network, a machine talking directly to another machine. Again, important, but not really showing much growth. And this one, data volume is absolutely taking off. It's a standard trend that on the mobile phone network, it's the data volumes that are really now driving these devices. We call them mobile phones, but it's not the telephony side anymore that's driving usage. It's the data side that's doing that. <coughs> um, the balance, uh, again, from uh, your regulator's uh, report, shows about 9% currently on 4G, 23% uh, on 2G. A lot of that is that machine-to-machine -machine stuff, and then the bulk of it, of course, is on 3G. In the UK, we have EE um, as a market leader in terms of, this is by revenue, this data, slightly different calculation. It's one of the most popular multi, uh, mobile virtual network operators, Virgin Mobile, which sits on the EE network. Then we've got Vodafone 0, 02 and 3. Now, British Telecom is in the process of buying EE for £12 billion. So BT, who created Cellnet, our second license, is about to re-enter the mobile fray and buy EE off T-Mobile and France Telecom. Meanwhile, 3, which has already bought O2 in Ireland, is looking to buy O2 in the UK for £10 billion. So the UK is about to do what you've done in Ireland. You've gone from four operators down to three. And it looks as though the UK is about to follow suit. And we'll have BT, Vodafone and three as the three mobile phone operators. Uh, interesting dynamic times in the mobile industry. So things are a, are a changing uh, in terms of ownerships. If you have a look at um, some market share data, 
If you look at this from Gartner, um, third quarter 2014, top selling mobile phones globally, Samsung, then Nokia, then Apple, then LG, then Huawei, then TCL. Now this is the sale of mobile phones of any flavour. Now just remember Nokia, Motorola, where's Motorola? Where's Blackberry? Gone. And then Motorola started all of this. Nokia was dominant. Nokia took over Motorola's first place spot and dominated. Now it's struggling a distant second and falling fast. If you now look at the global sales of smartphones as opposed to mobile phones, so this would include 2G handsets that are more phone than date, uh, smartphone. If you remove those and just look at smartphones, Nokia disappears. You've got Samsung, Apple, and then you've got Huawei, um, can't remember, um, Qui Qui-Com, is it? Ch it's Chinese, and Lenovo, Chinese. All of a sudden, it's Samsung, Apple, and China actually now become the smartphone sales of the world. So even Nokia disappear off that global path. If you then have a look at the operating system uh, that we operate on mobile phones, Android has a dominant 83.1% of the market, followed by Apple OS, and those eagle-eyed of you will spot that's exactly the same number as their global sales of uh, of smartphones, because they're the only ones who use that operating system. A Windows Phone, not really made an impact um, in this marketplace, and BlackBerry, just sneaking in there, for the first time in their history they fell below 1% of global market last year. Really, um, it's an independent operating system, these are four independent operating systems, but BlackBerry clearly uh, losing traction speed time uh, on uh, global sales. So it's an Android world, um, Android and iPhone world in terms of applications. And of course Android could be used on any platform. If you look inside, and this is pushing the UK now, there's a very important chip in there because of course the ARM processor which powers 90% of the world's uh, smartphones actually comes from ARM in Cambridge. Now they don't make chips. What ARM do is sell designs, risk machine designs that have been taken over and used by mobile phone manufacturers. So although the UK used to have two mobile phone manufacturers, um, it has none, but ARM can claim a very important part uh, of the global smartphone world. It's 30 years since in the UK at least, um, Early Wise made that inaugural public phone call and we've gone from the VM1, this is the VM1 model, you, you, all you can see of course is the handset he's holding there, um, the VM1 chunky car phone really, using cellular technology, to your iPhone 6 smartphone. And that's all happened from BRICS to 4G in literally 30 years, which in technological terms is not a lot of time. Um, it's accelerating the development, but I think there's a huge, you know, talking about the IET, engineering making a difference, having an impact. Engineers with the mobile phone have had a dramatic impact in terms of the social dimensions, it's not just about the technology, it's about how it's changed society, how we communicate, how we interact. All of this technology, engineers have actually made this work and had a dramatic impact. Whether you're a software engineer, writing apps, whether you're a radio frequency engineer, whether you're an electronics designer, whether you're the touch screen person, whatever it is, <coughs> that is full of science and engineering. And the depressing thing is, you go around schools, and you say to kids, what about science engineering? And they don't associate that thing in their pants with science and engineering. And they're wedded to the smartphone. They're wedded to the technology of engineers. 
and yet they don't always see the connection. So we have a bit of a job there to do uh, as engineers to promote the importance of what we do. Um, time is always short with these things. Uh, thank you for your attention. This photograph actually was taken at the stroke of midnight, New Year's Day 2014, going into the 1st of January 2015. I got my oldest Vodafone uh, analog uh, handset and I had my photograph taken as my celebration of the 30th anniversary, as my tribute uh, to the 30th anniversary of, uh, of the launch of Vodafone. Um, I know it's not the same phone they use. Um, <laughs> I know it was taken at a certain time, just looking from the photograph. Um, but that was my tribute to the 30th anniversary. I think it's a tremendous thing we've done. If you're interested in all of this stuff, I'm running a website called Engaging with Communications. That is it, uh, front page there. If you click on the historical link, you've got the mobile phone collection there to go and have a browse of uh, various articles we've put on there. And if you click on the talks, you can also look at a few videos we've done, including um, I've delivered for the Institution of Telecommunications Professionals, the ITP, which is very closely works with the IET, but is devoted to telecommunications. I actually had the privilege of delivering their Christmas lecture uh, on two occasions, and both were filmed, and you can watch those films on our YouTube channel via the uh, talks link on our website. So do please have a look. If you come across any artifacts historical about mobile phones or telecoms in general, and you want to share your own experience, your own thoughts, I'd be delighted to uh, have that communication with you, uh, either on Twitter or email, I'm happy to share my email address with you. Uh, I just think we should be preserving and celebrating these achievements, and particularly on the mobile phone side, we are terrible at doing it. I've actually had to loan mobile phones out of our collection to Vodafone so they could celebrate their 30th anniversary. I've no problem doing that, and I'm delighted to do it, because I was so pleased they wanted to bother, that I wanted to support them. So I don't have a problem with this, but I think it's indicative of one of the problems of that industry. So focused on tomorrow, we've neglected some of our achievements. What about the, the Science Museum? Are there any examples in the Science Museum in London? Yes, actually it's a good point that the Science Museum in London have just opened a brand new gallery called Information Age, and it celebrates communications from the global Telegraph networks right the way through to mobile. It's a brand new gallery. If you're in London, do please go along. It's a very good exhibition. Um, and there are Irish connections there, of course, because let's not forget the transatlantic telegraph cable went from Valencia Bay on the west coast of Ireland. That was the world's first real international uh, telegraph link. That spawned a global revolution in cabling up the world. So it's not a British story exclusively. So thank you anyway uh, for your invitation to come and talk to you tonight. And I hope you've uh, had some enjoyment.